There is a sadness in pondering what Neil Agate might have achieved if he had lived when one sees the achievement of his friend, Gavin Anderson, but also a sense that Neil would be proud to know that we are gathered here today to listen to Gavin Anderson. What a privilege it is to have you here today, Gavin. We look forward to your address as the 18th guest speaker of the Neil Agate Memorial Lecture here at Kingswood. Good morning to everybody. Before starting, let me thank Colleen Vassilou and her staff, her team, and all of you here today for inviting me to give this lecture and for the very warm welcome that I received. The beautiful uh, dinner yesterday with Jill Berger, Neil's sister, and Mavis Agat, his sister-in-law, and, and the good doctor. Very, very happy indeed to be with you. When I received the letter from Mrs. Retif inviting me to give this lecture, I was struck by the honor, deeply appreciative of this opportunity to speak at this commemoration. In a year in which it looks like at long last we are going to be able to persuade the National Director of Public Prosecutions to reopen the inquest into the death of Neil Agat in detention. So it's somewhat of a celebrative year to go with your 125th year anniversary. Immediately, the, the second reaction after that feeling of honor was, was a feeling of absolute panic. What could I possibly say that would be worthy of Neil and worthy of you today? Um, how on earth could I focus my thinking about the deeper meaning of Neil's life? But then mercifully, the very next day, a follow-up letter came which gave me the topic, and that, <laughs> that changed everything. So the topic for today is standing up against injustice. Narratives from different traditions around the world tell of heroic figures who stood against injustice, often at great personal cost. But we seldom get to know much about these mythical figures. They're larger than life. They, they demigods that, that hang above us in society as those who've gone before, who paved the way for everything good that's happened. And it's really valuable then that Kingswood College pays tribute every year to Neil, who in his very quiet, humble, and gentle way dedicated his life to justice, and who did ultimately pay the, what they say is the ultimate price for the stance. The very act of holding these lectures means that there's a deeper implication in the topic of standing against injustice. There's implicitly a question about how to do this. What do we learn from Neil's example? What is needed to bring us to stand up against injustice? How do we do so now, today, in the conditions of today and in the years ahead? in this country and in the increasingly interlinked world that we live in? How do we, each one of us, show leadership? I realized just two evenings ago that in thinking about what to say, I'd labored under misapprehension. Coming to Kingswood, I imagined that every single one of you would know everything about Neil. You'd have read this wonderful book by Beverly Naidu, in search, death of an idealist in search of Neil Agate. And so I'd be, in a way, just uh, playing around the edges, you know, giving a few insights, but you'd know all about Neil. And then two evenings ago, I was sitting with my two youngest children, who are 14 and 16, 
And I suddenly realized that there's hardly a chance that any of you <laughs> would have taken the time to read this book. Um, there's so much schoolwork, so much sport, music, social media, WhatsApp chats, that I'd be surprised if any have found the title. Just out of interest, indulge me please. Has anyone here read the, the book about Neil Agate? I, I see some, some adult hands, that's great. <laughs> it would be lovely if there were one or two from amongst uh, this body of youth that I see standing, uh, sitting in front of me by the end of the year. So here's the thing, I'm not going to go through Neil's life, but I will try and touch on some of the, um, some pieces about his character, weave some threads into the lecture about Neil. If this was a university lecture, I'd encourage you to stop me and ask questions and, and um, make observations, but perhaps at the end there might be time for that. So I met Neil very briefly in the early 1970s. He was a friend of my brother at medical school in Cape Town. But I really got to know him when he moved to Johannesburg in 1977. As, as the introductory remarks said, I'd, I'd been banned by the apartheid government at that stage. And this fact made several people nervous about being friendly with me. In those days, it was, it was dangerous to be associated with banned people. And certainly very, very dangerous to be associated with a banned political party. And particularly in the white community, I was treated with, with uh, a mixture of reverence and fear. So it was lonely being banned, but for Neil this made no difference at all. We became very, very close friends, um, starting off with growing vegetables together. I was recounting last night that the first major piece of work we did together was growing a potato, putting in, planting potatoes at the little cottage that he lived in just next to Timbisa. Um, Neil worked as a doctor at one of the public hospitals, initially at Tembisa and later at Baraguanath. And he could never join the permanent staff because he was dodging the military police because he'd been called up to the army, which in those days all white young men had to do to go and serve in the, in the army. And he, he refused. He refused to serve in an army whose major uh, purpose was to keep down the, 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 the majority of people in this country who were regarded as, as non-citizens, if you like. So he, he dodged military conscription and so took temporary jobs, a series of temporary jobs at, at public hospitals. He um, joined the Industrial Aid Society, which was a worker advice office, with a vision of starting a medical scheme that would give uh, first-rate medical services to all workers. That, that, didn't, that ran into difficulties, the idea, but Neil was nevertheless, he volunteered in all other capacities, was prepared to do whatever piece of work was useful. And um, used his medical expertise to attend to workers at any time of day or night. His little VW Beetle became a very familiar sight in Alexandra, Tembisa, Daviton, Watful, Fosluris, all the, the townships around Johannesburg. And he became a, a really loved and revered doctor. And I, I understood why when I watched him, I took him one night to, to uh, treat uh, um, the husband of, of one of the uh, shop stewards in the, in the union. And his, his manner of consulting was absolutely remarkable. He, he explained carefully what he saw happening, not talking down at all to the person, but talking as an equal, explaining the nature of the ailment, 
what he thought could be done about it, and helping the person to understand and own their condition and, and work with it. It was such a, a level of care and, and uh, tenderness almost that I think it sets an example for doctors anywhere in the world. So Neil became very, very loved. He, he also became very trusted in our little circle of trade union activists. And so when he got the chance to, to become an organizer finally for the Food and Canning Workers Union, we, we all did everything possible to support him. So although we were close friends, <clears throat> we, never we never spoke about our formative years. There were always more important things to discuss. We took the work of political activism seriously. We, had, uh, we read books in study circles every week, meeting and discussing a different book and what the insights from this book meant for our work today. And Neil was always the one who had done his reading. Uh, many of the others would wing it and arrive and, and uh, be prepared to, to try and you know, get through. But you could rely on Neil to have done his reading and to be able to launch a discussion that we could all get into. In personal uh, conversations, Neil introduced me to the poetry of Bertolt Brecht and Pablo Neruda which is a gift for life. Both of those poets have, have been with me ever since. Um, we discussed with great approval and excitement the rise of the black consciousness movement and what it meant for us as, as young white activists. I thought there was a question objection. Um, we discussed political events endlessly and when it was time to relax and party, we knew how to do that very well, too. <laughs> um, it was only after Neil's death that I learned anything about his childhood years in Kenya and his time here at Kingswood College. And since knowing about those, that, that history, that personal history, I've mulled over the influence of this childhood on this man, and I've wondered if it helps to explain his character, because like Neil, I come from a country outside South Africa, part of a very close-knit family like Neil, with a strong moral and, and uh, value base like Neil. And so in South Africa, I've always been part of the group that I'm in, but somehow also slightly different, observing, you know, an honored guest in this, in this company. And Neil had this manner that, that um, speaks a little bit to that. In every group, he was very easy, very present to all members of the group, but never being carried along by the group. He, he had this ability to, to listen to what was happening and to distill it to, to think before responding. He, he um, listened to anyone with deep and respectful attention, choosing his words carefully when responding. I never saw him ever react or to reject someone's point of view, even if it was completely against his own. He would, he would listen and provide a reasoned and thoughtful response. It, um, I've often wished that I could be as, as mindful as Neil was. Um, my, my moments of regret in life have always been when I react to something and then afterwards try and um, make peace with what I've just done. <laughs> so with Neil, there was very little ego driving him. His, my memory of him is, is of absolute calm, quiet man who always spoke his truth. He, 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 did not, he was not diffident. He didn't hang back. When there was an issue, he would state what he thought about it. Now, I mentioned these characteristics of the man at the outset because 
It seems to me, when reflecting on our topic for today, that we cannot think about standing up against injustice without having some conception of justice inside ourselves, something from deep within that drives us. Even in our daily lives, when we experience an instinctive and unplanned reflex against an injustice, perhaps when someone's bullying someone or something's happening that just isn't fair, there's a conception of justice that, that drives us, some sort of idea of what, what is right. And the thing that I learned from Neil is that we can't content ourselves with these reflexes and these assumptions about justice. Um, Neil maintained a consistent stance and was a steady and reliable companion uh, when looking at any issue that needed organizing. He was constantly seeking to improve himself and improve the quality of the contribution he was making. And I'd argue that this is what we, each of us are challenged to do if we want to emulate him. And this means, surely, becoming more familiar with the contours of justice. We need to know what we're standing up for. It's a, standing up against injustice is a deliberate stance. It's a deliberate cognitive stance. It's a way of looking at the world, deciding how to act on it, and steadily improving our own capability to be effective in that action. So we need to know when we stand up against injustice, what is the view we have of the justice we desire? I'd go so far as to say that if we learn only how to stand against injustice, then we can become the world champions of standing against injustice without ever changing the issue or, or system. Because to stand constantly against something means that that something continues to exist. And in fact, we're challenged now to change the world. Our societal task is to stand up for justice, to learn how to realize it in society and in our everyday lives. What does it look and feel like? What's the daily activity that we engage in? if we embrace justice? What do we do when we live as if justice matters? That's the question and the stance of the activist. That's the question that drove Neil Agut. We must learn to love the contours of justice. We must learn to etch them more deeply in our daily activity. Standing against injustice, we we see everywhere injustice at the end of the second decade of the 21st century. We live with cruel injustices that feed a daily experience of humiliation and violence to a large number of people, and that in turn brings more injustice in a spiral that comes to threaten our species. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So how do we find a way through the many injustices facing us? Here in South Africa, we have the most unequal society in the entire world. By all measures adopted by scientists, we have the greatest, the highest level of inequality in the world. The gap between the top 20% in society and the bottom 20% is greater here than anywhere else. We live in a country, I'm very sad to say this, but where on a daily basis more girls, women, and children are sexually abused, molested, and violated than anywhere else in the world. We are the world champions at gender abuse, at gender-based violence. We are amongst the world's leaders, small though our economy is, we are amongst the world's leaders in contributing to greenhouse gases and fossil fuel emissions. How do we find a means to navigate this morass? 
in a world where injustice presents itself at such a scale, how do we avoid feeling overwhelmed and powerless? How do we stand up against injustice? Before discussing any specific injustice and the particular injustices that will, that will demand attention from this generation that I see here, this generation of youth that will soon leave school, I want to propose a way of seeing justice, or differently, a way to frame injustice. And I draw on the work of a great Indian philosopher of science who is, who is still alive, thanks, thanks be to all creation, Prof. Shiv Viswanathan. He's argued for a concept of cognitive justice. Now, cognition means knowing or our ways of knowing. So cognitive justice is about doing justice to all forms of knowing, all bodies of wisdom. Viswanathan points out a disturbing truth about the astonishing technological progress that's been made since the first industrial revolution just over 200 years ago. Now, there's a story that when I was at school was, was completely hidden, but which is now common discourse through books of many authors about the last 500 years where Europe and her offshoots uh, colonized the world and became influential in shaping the world order. There's, there, there are stories that tell of the destruction of Af African civilizations and Indian civilizations and Latin American civilizations and uh, about slavery and um, colonialism that went along with the Industrial Revolution, that fed the, the Industrial Revolution and that, that ben and that was enabled by the Industrial Revolution. So these stories that were hidden only in my lifetime, hidden meaning they were never spoken about. There was, no, there was no history that we learned about that. These stories now come out. Start, we start to acknowledge that this is our common history. This is what we live with. But Professor Shiv is interested in one particular aspect of it. As a philosopher of science, he points out that a corollary of colonialism and the post-colonial aftermath that has gone almost unnoticed is that Western science has tended to obliterate all other forms of knowledge. As discovery built on discovery, technological innovation built on technological innovation, a dominant uh, Europe brought its version of civilization to different parts of the world. Those knowledges, some of them thousands and thousands and thousands of years in the making, disappeared. They were broken. So indigenous knowledge, which is the legacy of several hundred thousand years of human flourishing, is seen as an obsolete artifact. Shiv talks about the museumization of this knowledge. We, we see little uh, plaques showing the earliest writing in Ethiopia. It's, it's not learned from, it's, it's viewed as, as a quaint artifact. Western knowledge, what he calls Western knowledge, rules and prescriptions have broken the connection between third world people and their cosmologies, their way of understanding the universe, their way of responding to nature, their way of organizing life. Those connections and understanding have been broken. And instead, there's an understanding that you must rise to the level of this superior cosmology and way of looking at things. Now, Shiv says, quote, it is as if Western science at its moment of victory 
may have become authoritarian, unwilling to accept wisdom from any other knowledge systems. And he reflects that nationalist movements in Latin America, in India, and in Africa have tended to accept this, have taken on this knowledge. And um, yet, he points out, there's a major epistemological crisis for Western science because modernity, which is the, the bringing of this Western science to, to all of the world, modernity has not led to the reduction of human suffering and an improvement in the quality of life, but quite the opposite. Poverty, ecological destruction, and the displacement of traditional technologies have become the norm. So what is the solution to it? One that emerges readily and emerges now in the, through the Fees Must Fall movement is what Shiv calls revivalism, romantic calls for a return to the past and a rejection of all the colonial knowledge. Huh? So we've seen it here, a call for decoloniality, huh? decolonizing the curriculum. Well, that may be part of what's needed, but Shiv Vanathan argues that this is, this is not adequate. He calls then for a concept of cognitive justice, which would enable the building of a, of a new theory that, that can deal with the reality of the global economy. Cognitive justice in Shiv's mind involves a dialogic engagement between, on the one hand, the dominant modernizing Western knowledge constructs, and on the other, the indigenous and traditional knowledge formation. Crucially then, cognitive justice involves the right of a plurality of knowledge, not an imagine that there's imagination that there's only one way of seeing the world, but understanding that different ways of seeing exist, coexist simultaneously, and we can draw from each of them. Uh, Visvanathan suggests further that this implies strengthening the voice of the defeated and marginalized so that every citizen is seen as a scientist, every layperson is an expert. Science should be there to help the common woman and man. And all competing sciences should be brought together in a heuristic, a positive heuristic a learning framework for, for uh, dialogue. So, why do I go on this uh, detour on the philosophy of science? I think in the first place because Shiv helps us to reflect dispassionately on a history that normally when mentioned gets everybody angry. So angry that we can't talk to each other anymore. Uh, and yet it's our history. We cannot face up to the inequities and injustices of today unless we accept where we come from. What, what, what has happened before? So that's, that's valuable. But in the second place, I find Shiv's concept of cognitive justice with, with its uh, associated appeal for a pl plurality of knowledge to provide an explanation for some of the many injustices of our time and a guide for action today. Um, the notion of cognitive justice enables us to see other injustices for what they are and to systematically address them. So, if you have a singular worldview, one absolutely, this is the way of looking at the world, this is, what we, this is correct, this is the only way to understand this situation. Well, this worldview that asserts that there's only one truth and one way of seeing things, surely this is a, 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 an absolute essential enabler of ideologies of superiority ideologies like racism, like sexism, and any form of otherism, Islamophobia or xenophobia. 
they can only come into place if you, if you have an essentialist knowledge, almost a fundamentalist knowledge, recognition that there's one knowledge, and these people are against, are not with it, you know? If a, you, we hold a singular worldview, which has been diligently taught and espoused over the last 70 years about the market as determinant of our fate, then this renders us helpless against the injustice, the massive injustices of inequality, unemployment, and poverty. And yet, all of our science, Western science, shows us that what has enabled our species to survive and thrive over many, many millennia is our uh, habit and our instinct and our pattern of looking after each other, of not casting someone on the vagaries of the market where you become employed or unemployed. There's, scientists have done research on the human brain that shows that, that how much we are geared towards caring for each other. The, the concept of boto or Ubuntu, these are essential to every single people across the world. It's only here we, we remember them in Africa, in southern Africa, but this is where we come from. The cultural niche of our, uh, the ecological niche of our species, that which has enabled us to thrive in the world, is culture, is the ability to do things together, to, to invent meaning together, to care for each other, to, to uh, weave patterns of togetherness. That's, that's what has made us. And yet, we've been caught in a, in a worldview, in a mindset that, that looks to the market to organize our lives. This is nothing more than being trapped in a particular way of thinking. And Shiv's appeal to welcome a plurality of knowledges is one step to take us beyond this. A singular worldview that treats nature as an infinite resource to be used and plundered sees us hurtling towards extinction as we are on a collision course with reality. All of our best science tells us that we are in danger, and yet we follow blindly in the, with the worldview and the patterns of activity that come from it, believing some, something will sort something out. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. So, I would then assert with Shiv Visvanathan that if we are to tackle injustice, we need to go beyond that which has been handed down to us through Western science and the worldviews that we've been diligently taught to, to follow. We need to recover a plurality of knowledge to gather the shards of knowledges that have been broken in the past and put them together. We need to look beyond the truths of our present thinking towards ancient wisdoms as we seek to renew ourselves. We have to open ourselves to new ways of questioning and learning. Now, this isn't just an intellectual exercise. It might sound so. It might sound that we're becoming very esoteric and moving into the realms of philosophy. But in this very province, perhaps half a day's travel from here, Ekolobeni, The um, Amadiba Crisis Committee is meeting right now, just as we are, to celebrate Human Rights Day. But it didn't start with a meeting right now. It started with healers from across the country, from all parts of South Africa and some from Mozambique and Zimbabwe, traveling to be in Kolobeni. With the, with the people there. Tolobeni falls at the base of the Nile Meridian. 
There's a magical meridian, very, uh, very big in African philosophy. And along the Nile meridian, you'll find the Sphinx, the pyramids of Giza, Great Zimbabwe, and Tlolobain. There are other marks as well. There's whole legends woven around this meridian. They call it the Golden Meridian. This tale, Credo Mutua talks about an underground river that flows from south to north along that meridian. I, does, I don't know. It's another, there's, a, there's a, another knowledge system that we glimpse when we hear the story. So all of these healers, spiritual leaders, sangomas, made their way yesterday and, and through the night, last night. Last night was the equinox and full moon. People were praying, paddling, they were dancing, they were singing songs to the Creator. They were imploring the ancestors to come and align with the work of today. And today, the whole community gets together to pray that their way of life will be respected. Now, in fact, we see in dramatic form the clash of modernity with indigenous knowledge systems and ways of living. Because there's money to be made in mining the land, the sand dunes on which that community live. And there's an Australian mining company that's itching to make that money from taking, from eating up that land that has sustained people for hundreds and hundreds of years. And of course, the government is desperately needing some activity, some economic activity to boost our fragile economy. So the government tends to align with the Australian mining company. There's no dialogue between knowledge systems. There's no recognition of a plurality of knowledge that is needed. Instead, there's, there's a, a battle where the power of the market is cast against those who are seen as drags on process. And gifts of money are given to try and weaken the resolve of the people. And so far, there have been 12 assassinations of those opposed to mining. So this is not a little thing, this, this uh, matter of um, singular forms of, of, of knowledge setting course to do something and, and obliterating and, and pushing down other knowledge systems. They have very practical effects. Let me then move a little. I've heard people lately saying that my generation was lucky because things were so much simpler in the days of the liberation struggle. It was clear who the enemy was. You had a minority government forcing a racist ideology on the black majority and trying to organize society in the way that it thought best without consulting the people, and in fact, doing it forcefully. So it was easy, I'm told, to take a stand. In fact, there's humorous comments made in very many newspaper articles these days that it's, it's hard to find any white person these days who didn't take a stand against apartheid. You would, you'd be forgiven for thinking that the whole white population were against apartheid. And it was so, but that's the extent to which today it is seen as obvious that you should take a stand. It wasn't obvious. When Neil chose not to go to the army, he made himself a refugee inside his country. And very few white men did this. On the, I was in Cape Town in the National Gallery. There's a wall which has got portraits of the white men who refused to go to the army. And I must tell you that there are only about, I didn't count them, but 18 or 20 portraits out of the whole white population. 
So it wasn't easy to take a stand. It needed people to see beyond what they were being taught, in the indoctrination that was being given, and to stand up for, some, for justice that they knew from inside. Ne? Now, I mention this because your generation, I'm looking beyond the elders gathered at the front to all of you sitting in your beautiful Kingswood attire. Your generation faces a catastrophe that will be obvious in 15 years or so. It'll be so obvious that people will wonder why you didn't see it today. And I'm talking about climate change. I'm talking about climate justice. I'm talking about the threat that climate change poses to our species, to living, to all living on Earth. Now, I, I, I raise this with great humility. If my generation was honest and even a little aware, we would be down on our knees apologizing to you for the world we've carved for you. The youth who are soon going to leave school are faced with probably the greatest challenge faced by humanity over the last 5,000, 10,000 years. Climate change is happening. And the science is very easy. I'll go on a little brief excursion again that nitrogen forms about 78% of our atmosphere and oxygen about 21%. Each of these gases combine in just two, two atoms form a, form a molecule of oxygen and of nitrogen. They're very tightly packed. So light coming in from the sun goes through ultraviolet light and infrared light without, and hits the earth and bounces back without it's done that for several million, million years so far, and does it without any trouble. However, gases like carbon dioxide, CO2, and methane, CH4, are with three or more atoms joined together in quite a loose array. They, it, they occupy more space. The light coming through does not just bounce back. The infrared light, which is a slightly broader vibration, gets trapped by these gases. So the atmosphere warms up. That's the simple science. Now, we have, since the Industrial Revolution, what they call the Second Industrial Revolution, which, which started to use fossil fuels very, very heavily, the first, you know, they used oil. Hmm? The first industrial revolution needed coal, again, a fossil fuel. But with the, with the use of oil came all these wonderful technology, cars, airplanes, machines, all sorts of things that use oil. We even use oil in agriculture today as, uh, to feed plants. We're using chemical fertilizers made from oil pesticides made from oil. So we're using, so this is carbon that we're bringing up that was put there from ancient sunlight, they say. You know, millions of years ago, forests bloomed and then this, the, 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 the wood, the carbon that was there was packed into the earth as coal and oil. We're bringing it up and we're releasing it into the atmosphere. The scientists say that, that uh, we have, I think, it's, uh, 410 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere at the moment. The last time we had this was five million years ago. 
And at that stage, the oceans were 30 meters higher than they are now. Because this amount of CO2 brings a temperature increase. We are ready, as we sit here, can say with confidence that within 15 years, we will not have an Arctic cap anymore. That ice will have melted. There's nothing we can do to stop it anymore. Inexorably, it is melting. You've seen pictures of polar bears dancing on, on bits of ice as they try and find their way across what used to be home. Huh? That's the beginning. But definitely, we know for an absolute fact that there will not be an, a, a, an Arctic Circle anymore. The big fear of scientists is that that part of the world, there's a permafrost in Siberia, which is where there's permanently iced ground that contains beneath it methane. More methane than is possible to imagine. And the question is, what happens when that methane adds to what we're adding to the atmosphere? Some people have an apocalyptic vision because they say that immediately that methane gets, we finished, we become a hurtling fireball in space. Now, I hope I'm scaring you because the problem we have is that we're so fixed in a certain worldview and a certain idea that, w that this Western science has brought us such progress that it can't possibly be wrong. And uh, standing here, there'll be a Donald Trump sitting in the front audience saying, no, no, you know, you, you just don't understand. And you're a climate, you know, you're, you're a doomer. You're a doomer. You know, you just, you, you, you're looking on the, the, the negative side of everything. There are those people already. Mm -hmm. We have to face up to truth. We can't allow an ideology of the market, which says we must carry on as normal. We can't allow that ideology to, to blot out science. We must trust the best of what our science tells us. Coca-Cola recently did an inventory of how much plastic it produces every year. It produces three million tons of plastic in a year. Now, plastic, again, comes from oil. That's, you know, again, I mean, the, the immediate effects aren't felt in the atmosphere. The immediate effects are found in fish that, that can't breathe, that are dead, because they've taken in plastic. Whales with their bellies full of plastic. When Coca-Cola tried to visualize what three million tons a year look like, they used the largest living mammal, the blue whale, and they tried to see what, what, how many million tons would pack into one blue male, whale. And there are 15,000 blue whales worth of plastic that they produce each year. They, they aren't alone to any thought. And the big question is, how do we stop it? Because people will tell you the whole economy depends on this. So. Your generation is tasked with figuring this out. We, we are really locked into a spiral that will, that will, of a certainty, bring extinction of our species within the next 200 years. Already, we see insects, the whole species dying. We read, anyone who follows any science literature, see, they're, they're, they're species dying on a daily basis. We've started, they're calling this the, the fourth mass extinction. You, you know, there have been different extinctions. The one I know about is when the dinosaurs got ma made extinct because some asteroid hit Earth and it changed things. We are in a, a period of mass extinction. This requires honesty and it requires commitment and requires leadership. And my generation has proved that we are inept. We are unable to come up with the changes that are needed and to insist that they take place. This is the task which we leave. 
for you, with no pride at all, with, with a great sense of betrayal of our children. So, how, in the face of, of calamities like this, of injustices like this, because climate, is inju climate justice or climate injustice is an injustice against all of us, actually. We used to say that it's, this is an injustice to the future generations, but it's now you are the future generations. Th those of you in the room, in 20 years' time, many of you will have children. Those children are in peril unless, unless we can deal with this. And how do we do it? I don't know. We are at a moment in history that needs new thinking and new determination and new leadership. We saw a little bit of that leadership. We've seen it over the last six months. In August last year, a young girl called Greta Thunberg, aged 15, bunked school on a Friday. She persuaded her parents that it was okay. They were very worried about it, but they allowed her to do it. She, she bunked school and she went and stood on the steps of the Swedish parliament, protesting about the fact that governments throughout the world have done nothing about the accelerating global warming. She did it again the next Friday, and she did it again the Friday after that, caused all sorts of fuss, lots of newspaper articles, right? you know, you really need to go to school if you're going to become anything in life. Last Friday, March the 15th, um, March the 15th, we saw hundreds and thousands of youth your age in Copenhagen, Helsinki, Milan, Bombay, Mumbai, Berlin, London, Cape Town, Barcelona, Lagos, Hong Kong, Lisbon, Ottawa, Madrid, a hundred, more than a hundred cities across the world saw thousands of youth standing up with hashtag Fridays for Future. So what the least that this shows, this young woman has shown, this teenager, by her decision to stand against injustice, she's crystallized a recognition across the world that individual citizens do have power. They have power to influence our collective destiny. We don't have to stand and watch as forces beyond our control drive us towards oblivion. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about what, else, what we can do, because surely standing up every Friday does not change the world. It only reminds us that we have to. But before moving on, I just want to observe a little closely the method of Greta Thunberg. So, in, in uh, leadership studies, we observe that when you're working on a system, you need to understand that all parts of the system are interlinked. And an intervention at any point in the system affects the rest of the system. Yeah? So the thing to do in terms of individual action is to bring a learning disturbance, what I call a learning perturbation to the system, but to bring it at regular intervals, at the same interval. So if you drop a stone in a pond of water, there'll be ripples that go out. If a minute later you drop a stone, the ripples will build on the original ripple. And a minute later you drop another stone, so it'll until eventually the whole pond is heaving from these stones at the exact interval. If you drop it 
at half a minute, two minutes, five minutes, well, the ripples cancel each other out. So it's the exact moment. So they say Lech Valencia. This is now ancient history, but, but uh, there used to be something called the Soviet Union before 1989. And it seemed like a, a fact of life, a monolith that could not be broken. And then it collapsed in a period of about six months. And a lot of people put the beginning of that collapse to a moment when in Poland, a large trade union called Solidarity formed. So how did it form? On a Tuesday morning, one and a half hours before work began, a man called Lech Valencia and two of his friends met to say, look, this is intolerable. What are we going to do about it? This is, I mean, we can't carry on like this. This is crazy. And agreed, okay, next Tuesday, let's meet again and bring a couple more of our friends. So they met for six Tuesdays in the morning. And suddenly, out of those six meetings, emerged a trade union with hundreds and thousands of workers which rattled the whole cage of Poland and led to this and led to that and contributed, didn't cause, but contributed to the fall of the Soviet. So there you have the same principle. A, a repeated learning perturbation at regular intervals. Yeah? I could talk about some other examples, but I won't. So, so, so essentially this is what Greta Thunberg has done here. She's launched a, a mass wave of, of protest and recognition that we need to act. But standing up in this way is not, it might, it's not sufficient, and, it's, and um, it's certainly not the only way. The, um, work of, of studying, understanding a different way of doing things, quiet research, diligent ongoing conversation, working out of position, um, small acts of leadership at home, at school, in the broader society. These are vital corollaries to public work an effort to link with your peers and friends in creating something meaningful is, is as vitally important as anything else I can think of. Again, from leadership studies, we talk about a fractal. In, in nature, you get small repeated patterns that make up nature. So a leaf is made up of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of little leaves. Each leaf looks the same. Together they make the tree. You can study, whenever studying nature, you can see the, the small, this intricate system that becomes the whole. Our bodies are made up of cells, and inside each cell is, is, our, is the, the, the DNA that's been inherited. There's uh, energy, um, there's engines, if you like, of, of life. The, the, the life process within each cell contributes to the whole of who we are. So what happens if we create a fractals of activity? Working with others, we create an activity that, is, uh, that works in this instance for climate justice. Many fractals make up the whole. So if we, if we start organizing circles like this and we create a learning framework to learn our way into the future, to find a, something that makes sense, acknowledging that we don't have the answers, but we are learning our way, perhaps we could achieve something. Especially, you know, another thing that captures us today is the concept of the bounded enterprise. So, so you're either a company is defined by its purpose, its reason for being, who's in and who's out. And companies then decide their competitive advantage, their unique selling point, their core competence. 
and forget everything outside that. No company is tasked with dealing with, with uh, the fact that the vast majority of our citizens continue to be excluded from economic life. No company has to think about that. They only have to think about how to sell the widget. Huh? Similarly, government departments are bounded. What if we went beyond these boundaries, if we worked across, create the circles here at Kingswood College? What if the whole school became many fractals of activity for justice? What if, what if they reached across then to the citizens in Grahamstown and to people in other parts of, of the world? What could happen? What if it became infectious? If everybody started to do this thing because it's self-evidently right and it feels good and, it, and there's value in working together, what would happen? We, we can't anymore sit and look at big systems that are ruining lives and that definitely will see us collapse and disappear as a species. We can no longer sit and watch. Individual leadership matters. Acting in little groups matters. So I haven't dealt here with economic justice, which is another task for your generation. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I wish those of us who went before you had got it a bit better thought through. But we now know that there will never again be full employment. In fact, all the future studies, people who deal with future studies, show less and less employment. They see robotics taking the place of human labor. So you have a certainty that if you go along the normal course of events, a large number of you coming from a very uh, strong stratum in society will be unemployed. And yet, Employment's the only way we have right now to get food. So you're seeing lots, you know, millions of people in this advanced society of ours starving. Whereas we had other systems of social organization throughout history, throughout the last 12,000 years, where no one starved, where no one was unemployed, where everybody was looked after. So we're needing to recreate an economic imagination. And I, I won't go beyond just saying that, that this is a task for you, bearing in mind what has brought our species to flourish, which is care for each other. Essentially, care, dignity, giving dignity to each other, respect, love. These are little things, they're important. So let me, um, I, oh, I haven't dealt with probably the most urgent task for us in South Africa right now, which is to bring gender justice. Somehow we're all implicated in this. When you look at the amount of abuse happening every day, all of us say, that's not about me, man, that's someone else. And yet, somewhere in the messages we give, the stances we take, the the way I ask my young daughter, oh, you, you, you've put on a little bit of weight. What is that about? You know, these reflexes we have that, that trap us into these male-female ways of relating that in the end bring horror and pain and trauma on a greater number of, of women and girls, a greater percentage than anywhere else in the world. We need to deal with this. So I can't, I'm not going to talk into what we need to do, but just to point out, we have urgent, when, when asking, standing up against um, injustice, there are so many ways we need to learn to stand up. There, we, we, we can't, this is not an abstract question. This is the very fabric of our lives. So let me, oh, there's a Zen saying, there's so much to do and so little time goes slowly. 
whatever we do, make it meaningful. So to close, I'd like to just again return to the, the lessons we get from Neil's life. Neil brought dignity to every human interaction. He put himself at the service of others without any question every day. He was very quiet, but he wasn't diffident. He didn't hold back. He spoke his truth. He stood up for what he believed. He didn't judge others. He reached out to them and tried to explain. And he, didn't, he learned, but didn't deviate from a course of justice. He always acted on his word, on the smallest things. What he said, said he would do, he did. Now, what would be the synergetic, you know, this idea of synergy, where people doing things together create an effect greater than the single parts, where one and one equals three or five? What would be, can you imagine? the synergetic impact if all of Kingswood and all your families acted like this, if you set out to live this kind of life and to live justice in your daily lives. Can you imagine the impact? What if it became infectious? We're growing circles of people acted like that. We're growing circles of people tackled, worked for climate justice, worked to build the local economy where everybody could could live with dignity, work to build housing associations or, or buying cooperatives or growing cooperatives? What if every single person here and all the families worked every day firmly took a stand against gen for gender justice? What would happen? So I was going to end the lecture with a poem that Neil had, had given, had shown me from Bertolt Brecht, and it's called Dying Poets Address to Young People. And it starts by saying, oh, ye young people of times yet to come and cities yet to be born. And it goes on and it, and it's, it ends up by saying, whatever you do, don't listen to me. <laughs> don't listen to the likes of us. We've done everything wrong. We don't, have, we don't have, have anything to teach you except to teach you not to follow our example. So that was going to, but it seemed a bit of a gloomy way to end, you know? So although it's true, your, your, your young generation need to recognize that in you, you, you need to now, today, take, take hold of, of the future because otherwise there won't be one. So I'll end instead with a poem from His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I, Jarastafari. And it goes like this. We must look into ourselves, into the depths of our soul. We must now become something we have never been before for our education, and our environment have all prepared us. We must become bigger than we have ever been, more courageous, greater in spirit, larger in outlook. We must be members of a new race, overcoming petty prejudice systems and owing our intelligence not to nation, but to fellow woman and man within the human community. Ralbuch Gumenachan. <laughs>